Okay, great. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, COVID clemency campaign um, press release conference call. Um, I want to thank everybody for putting up with technology challenges. We would love to be doing this in person outside the state capitol or the governor's mansion or state office building in downtown Milwaukee. Um, but we can't be doing that, that right now because of the pandemic. Um, so I hope that everybody who wanted to was able to join and get in on the meeting. Uh, sounds like there's more people joining now. We've got, looks like uh, 20, 26 people um, participating, which is great. Um, so today what we are doing is we're announcing uh, Forum for Understanding Prisons COVID clemency campaign. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been helping incarcerated people put together clemency criteria waiver requests. And tomorrow morning, Peg Swan, who is FFUP's founder, will be putting the first batch of 30 of these requests in the mail to Governor Evers. Um, as many of you know, Governor Evers has refused to even consider releasing people using his clemency and pardon powers. The criteria that he chose excludes anyone who didn't complete both incarceration and supervision more than five years ago. Um, and they also put a lot of limits on like what kind of uh, convictions people had as far as like only nonviolent people are even being considered for pardons. Um, and we know that the pardon board has denied a lot of pardons, even with people who fit those stringent criteria. So the governor has taken very little action. Um, and right now, uh, what we're doing is filing requests for those criteria to be waived in the face of the COVID pandemic um, and for the people to be considered for release. Um, the best way to reduce uh, the risk and to mitigate the problem of COVID-19 traveling through the prison system is to reduce the population density by letting out as many people as they possibly can. So we organized this campaign because we know that if, if people just put these clemency waiver requests in the mail, um, they'll, the chance of them being seriously considered would be very low. And so we're going to continue to hold online press conferences like this with updates. We're gonna keep working on this campaign through social media and through reach outreach to um, reporters in the media to let people know and make it clear to the governor that um, you know these are not things to be ignored that this is important and that he needs to take action on this. Um, FFUP is a nonprofit organization where advocacy and research organization focusing on Wisconsin prisons. Uh, our mission is basically to make incarcerated people visible to uphold their voices and assert their presence in the state. Um, prisons are tools for uh, erasing people from society and letting people think that, um, you know, these people don't exist anymore. They don't need to be worried about. They're not really fully human. And we object to that and we uh, fight against it every day. So I'm um, just going to share some numbers real quick before we get into the actual um, content of this call. This is just to give us a little bit of a framework. Uh, the total population of the prison system last Friday was 2, uh, 22,713 people. That's 585 fewer people than on March 20th. So that's a 2.5% decrease. That's how the DOC and the governor have responded to the COVID-19 outbreak so far. Um, the thing with those numbers is that the DOC released statements saying that they were letting out over 1,000 misdemeanor revocations, uh, 65 people who are taking programs at MSDF and other people on special action release. Um, we have heard that there are some people who are getting out, but those numbers obviously don't add up. Um, so we don't understand what's going on um, and the DOC is not transparent uh, with what they're doing as far as um, releasing people. Uh, it's not happening as fast as they are saying it's happening and it's not happening fast enough. Um, we also have numbers about testing. So the uh, Wisconsin prison system, everybody who's in there is considered tier one testing priority by the De Department of Health Services. Uh, that's because they're confined in uh, high, tightly you know, space. Um, nursing homes are also considered tier one. Other places like that where people can't help but live close to each other and social distancing is very difficult. Um, despite every incarcerated person, all 22,000 um, being tier one level 
uh, risk and priority for testing, the testing for them has been a little bit more than half of the rate uh, of the total population. So there's like 5.8 million people in the state of Wisconsin, and there have been 50,000 tests in Wisconsin prisons um, since the start of the, the pandemic. There were 23. 0.5 or 23,400 people in the prisons and there have only been 111 tests. So that's a rate of 0.8% uh, in the state of Wisconsin and 0.47% in the prison system. Uh, we also see a slightly higher uh, rate of positive tests. Um, of So of those very few tests that have happened in the prison system, uh, almost 10% of them have been positive, whereas almost 9% have been positive uh, statewide. Um, we believe that if testing was being adequately done in the prison system, uh, we would probably see a much higher rate. There's um, a lot of different questionable things going on as far as testing goes. Um, so that's just to give us a little bit of a framework of what's going on inside the prison system, how many people at risk, and uh, how the DOC's response uh, has not been adequate. Um, but now we want to get to a more personal level with this. So we've brought on some speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them, and they'll each speak for about 10 minutes or less. And then we'll move on to questions. Um, and we'll open the questions to reporters first, and then to anybody else on the call. Um, for this call, we have uh, family members of two people with immune compromising disorders. Um, both of these people are still relatively young, but they are very much at high risk. On future calls, we hope to explore other issues like elderly people uh, or people with very small sentences or very little time left on their sentences. Um, this is just a start. We'll be doing these calls uh, more into the future. So, uh, our first so our speakers are Jody Nelson, Tamika Allen, Peg Swan, um, and uh, I am going to be just moderating and trying to help uh, help this go along. And I also want to uh, thank and uphold um, Ty, who is doing a lot of the technical aspects of this. Um, okay, so we're going to start with Jody Nelson. Uh, her son is 35 years old. His name is Ryan Lemke. He's incarcerated at uh, Jackson Correctional, and he has uh, autoimmune disorder. Um, so, yeah, if we want to unmute Jody and, and let her take it away. My son has ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disorder. He has to have regular scheduled infusions of Remicade treatments that compromises his immune system even more. There has been several times he has not been taken for his infusions on time, causing him a setback and discomfort. He also has had his medications messed up on several occasions by not giving him the correct dosage or on time. When Ryan returns from his infusion treatments, he will be put into the isolation unit for two weeks, where new arrivals are put when they first come into the facility, put him, putting him at even a greater risk of contracting COVID-19. The facility has had two new inmates come in just last week. They are still transferring special placement needs people, emergency transfers from institutions to institutions. There is no social distancing. They eat together, share the same day room, use same bathrooms, sinks, chairs, showers, and phones. Staff does not wear masks. They go from unit to unit, including the isolation unit. They do room searches, touching inmates' personal property. Guards wear gloves, but do not change them or wash or sanitize them before going into the next room. If COVID-19 gets into this facility, it is a death sentence for my 35-year-old son. Last time I checked, Wisconsin does not have the death penalty, and yet this is a death sentence for my son. Ryan received his early PRC request back yesterday, denying it saying a health condition does not warrant placement in ERP. He can file an EHC. Ryan was a neuro, neuro, neurodiagnostic technician in California before moving back to Wisconsin. 
He has completed several programs since his incarceration, the latest being Electromechanical Mobile Lab, which Senator Smith attended his graduation. Ryan has also had a job and sometimes two at the same time since he's been incarcerated. He also is living on a day-to-day -day fear of contracting this COVID-19. He's mentioned to me several times that he wants to even stop his treatments to avoid being quarantined with new inmates, which if he does that, it could cause major relapse. He could become septic or even go into septic shock and that itself could kill him. He is scared every day and he is highly stressed as I am too. I have tried several outlets to try to find any kind of help I could get to get my word out there to try to find him any kind of help. And I seem to be getting not much back except for this group here today. And I thank you all very much. Ryan belongs to Pipe and Drum, and he's trying to follow his heritage of Native American. He coaches softballs. He um, works, several, like I said, several jobs. And my main concern is that the, the pressure that's, he's so stressed right now that he's seriously thinking of being um, taken off his treatments. And I'm also afraid that he's going to have some repercussion if they find out that I've done this interview today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, uh, we're trying to make sure and find out whether or not Tamiko is able to get on the call. Um, we're going to try, Ty's going to try calling her. I'm um, sorry, I, I was distracted by trying to figure that out. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, it's a terrible story. Um, and the DOC's failure to address all of the people. I mean, Ryan is just one of many people who have these kinds of diseases. The, the rate of these things in prisons is much higher because medical care has been inadequate for centuries uh you know since the start of the prison system people who are incarcerated have not gotten the same kind of medical care that they would on the outside um and so those disorders get worse and they're not treated properly and so we have really high rates of people who are at that kind of risk um I, they canceled his like appointments can you talk a little bit more about that it's not that they canceled him. Um, he was scheduled for infusions every six weeks. And um, this has been going on since he was transferred from Dodge to Jackson Correctional. But yet they weren't making appointments for him until seven, eight weeks out. And at that time, at the six-week limit, he already starts to feel the, the side effects of the infusion wearing off and then add another week or two to that, it brings him down even lower, which takes the next infusion longer to take effect. Mm -hmm. The um, specialist that he does see off in the institution finally upped it to every four weeks. So um, that means he'll be two weeks into isolation, out two weeks, taken back out, and that's only if they do it on time. And that was just recent that they did that. So the mm -hmm. last two, they actually did make his appointment on time, but they have been inconsistent on getting him there, you know, for his infusions. And so when he's in quarantine after being transferred out to, to do those infusions, he's with other people who are at risk or at, who have, um, are, are possibly infected with COVID-19. So he's in the same place with other people who might, might. so he's higher risk because of his uh, immune disorder and he's being housed with other people who are at risk of having been exposed um, during that, that two week period. Correct. So yeah, this is just- Including new inmates that come in because everybody that's being transferred there now will be quarantined in the same quarantine unit that he will be brought to. Mm -hmm. 
So and yeah, this is just one of them. The immune, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. The no immune uh, infusions the, of the Remicade that he gets, it, it lowers his immune system even more, which means he's susceptible to any kind of infections, especially this COVID-19. Hmm. Ty, were you able to get to me Okay. Well, um, we're gonna let we're gonna unmute uh, Peg for a minute, and then hopefully Tamika will join the call, um, and we'll be able to have her speak uh, next. But we're gonna we're gonna go on to Peg Swan. So Peg is uh, founder of FFUP. She's been working for fifteen years. Um, Ty, can you unmute? Yeah. She's all set. Is she there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello. I am. Can you hear yes, me? we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can see myself. That's pretty tough. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna uh, put it away. So, um, <laughs> oh, oh, there's my there he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things um, I want to say is that the waiver is in the the waiver. These guys are, are people are filling out is in the application. And it's, its only criteria um, is, what is your extraordinary circumstance? Why do you think you should get out? And I would like to see, the reason we're putting in everybody, including, you know, we have a whole lot of people that were supposed to be deported 10 years ago, um, that the absurdly held, I, I, I call that, um, so that the, the criteria remains broad. And um, the COVID, every time we let somebody out, makes it safer for those that are that are back in. Um, there, if you look at, I did send a um, a uh, list of the people we do have. We, we, we're sending the waiver, waivers in on, and a lot of them are elderly, and they are underrepresented to here with families, um, partly and. Um, you know, partly because they're 60, 70 years old. Um, and um, uh, um, the overcrowding, understaffing, and uh, of, the, of the system does not allow any good care or any good staff. I think that's the big thing in the system, that only by fudging, by lying, no transparency can it exist that they should be yelling loudly. We were horribly understaffed and the staff tends to get cynical because they cannot give good care. Um, the, the prison system lost its mission when it went from 7,000 prisons to 22,000 in a decade with the prison boom. They only could do that by putting people in prison who didn't belong there. And they, they used solitary, um, as a population control tool. So the prison, my point is the prison starts out dysfunctional. Only, um, I, I used to be sort of friends with the, um, the, the DOC uh, health director and he would say he cannot pay enough to get good, um, good people. Um, I can go on forever. Uh, ben, <laughs> you have you have to prompt me. So yeah, that's one thing to bring it back to COVID nineteen. You know, I've also had conversations with uh, Makta Fesahaya, who is the head of the Division of Adult Institutions. Uh, when I met with her a few months ago, she said the same thing that they are severely understaffed for health professionals, and that they have a really hard time retaining people in that role. Um, and but she said the problem was pay, but you're saying that the former health director um, was saying that you, you can't pay somebody enough to ignore the Hippocratic Oath and to work in, in these kinds of conditions. Right. Um, and I think that's true. Um, but still, now when I've talked to her since the outbreak of COVID-19, um, she has said that they're fine, that they don't have any, any issues uh, with staffing of medical um, medical people to, to deal with the problem. 
Um, and I just don't see how that can possibly be true since they had a problem and they were at a crisis prior to this happening um, for it to that crisis to have suddenly gone away is absurd. It makes no sense. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, what has happened, and it's been very sad, um, that uh, we all had a lot of hope when the new administration came in uh, and and slowly they've gotten to the same um uh it's not lying it's simply no transparency and not being truthful to us and that's very sad and that's how they are uh there's one where uh, uh, all through the system there's no attempt except in quiet times a lot of staff i hear are they will be honest and caring if it's not seen Mm -hmm. It has gone sour. The system has gone sour. So what we hear with the COVID, I'm really sad to hear that about Mata. She's gone down the steps to obfuscation. You know, you cannot get, we, we did the, um, um, when um, the elderly man uh, asked uh, a, 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 a nurse had a face mask on and was, and was changing his ba bandage. She, she, he said, why do you have the face mask on? She said she was um, uh, exposed to COVID-19. And uh, he said, why are you here? She said, we have to come unless we show symptoms. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, that's a thing that we, we heard about and we, you know, last week we were really trying to, um, get some answers about that. That's one of the last time I, I actually spoke say, with I went her. everywhere and we just got obfuscation. Right. right. Yeah, so that's at, um, to just give some background for that, that's at Columbia Correctional in, in a unit where everybody there has these health problems. Um, they're, they use wheelchairs, they've got diabetes. Um, the guy who contacted us is a double amputee because of diabetes. And he, so they're working closely with these medical staff um, and those medical staff, even if, even after they admitted to being exposed, um, were still coming in. And uh, a sergeant in that unit also admitted to being exposed. And she said that she's required to continue coming in. Um, the DHS guidelines are that if somebody has been exposed, they should self-quarantine for 14 days and should stop working. That's for healthcare workers across the state. Um, but apparently the DOC doesn't believe that applies to them. Um, unless yeah. unless they show symptoms. Yeah. Right. Is, is, is there, a, I was thinking if, if we have time, um, Ron Schilling's uh, friend, Richard, is he, on, is he on call? I was thinking we could bring somebody else in. I don't see a Richard. Did Tamika get? Tamika distracted. Okay, so Tamika has just joined in. Um, so Tamika's brother, his name is Dewitt Faulkner. Uh, he's 39 years old. He has asthma and lupus, um, and he's been a source for all of us um, on the outside. He's been sending emails out telling us about what's going on. Um, so we're really excited to have Tamika joining the call as well. Uh, can you? She's unmuted. All right. Tamika, are you there? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. Uh, what you said again? Okay. So, so yeah, if you want to just kind of introduce yourself and um, talk about Dewitt and what what he's experiencing, what he's been telling you about from inside. Uh, okay. So no problem. I'm uh, Tamika Allen. Um, my brother is Dewitt Faulkner. Um, he has uh, severe asthma and um, it's been going on throughout his whole uh, life uh, since I can remember. And most recently, uh, I want to say about maybe about six or seven years ago, I'm not too sure. Um, the correct diagnosis is not lupus, it's, it's, uh, it's some kind of disease that's compatible to lupus. Um, so I just want to clarify that I don't want to give out any misinformation on um, what issues that he had up in um, Morning Park in Columbia Correctional Institution. Uh, but my main issue 
is his asthma, because he's asthmatic and it's severe, and we all know the COVID-19 attacks the respiratory um, system. Um, I'm just, I just want to raise awareness to everyone or anyone who have any loved ones that uh, locked up in the Wisconsin Correctional Facilities um, on giving them like uh, relief to a different, a minimum security or um, people that just really don't have, uh, have very little time left, uh, relief, relief to go home to their loved ones because um, it's not their fault that they get infected with this disease when we all know they they can't go anywhere. So uh having to contract this disease while you incarcerated is just so unheard of. Um and the fact that they're not getting the treatment. Um I have I've been reaching out to the social workers there, still have not heard anything yet. And I communicate with my brother through by email. Um that's basically been our only forms of communication, uh, especially since uh, two inmates escaped this past weekend. Uh, so, I don't know. I just want to know what I can do um, on my part to uh, bring awareness and to uh, get some help for these inmates. Uh, there's contracting this disease again that staff members had to bring in to the facility. Well, thank you for participating in this call. That's definitely one thing that we can do is support the call for these clemencies um, and for releases. And so uh, a lot of the power is in, hand, in the hands of the governor. Um, Tony Evers on the campaign trail said that he was going to reduce the prison population by half. Um, he has not instituted those policies before coronavirus and has not significantly um, taken action to mitigate the effects of the coronavirus in the prison system. Um, so this call is one of our ways to try to get the, the pressure and the attention on Governor Evers and to let the public know that he's not taking okay. action on his campaign promises and um, that especially right now, uh, we need we need to see some movement on this. So um, we've gotten uh, at least one question from from uh, a reporter on the call, but I wanted to give uh, each of our speakers another chance to just say or, or add anything. So um, Jody, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, just that as they were talking about testing, as far as I know we're in Jackson Correctional, that they have not offered any kind of testing for the COVID-19 to the inmates. So yeah, we've got um, issues with testing. Looks like, according to the DOC's number, they have done one test at Jackson Correctional Institution, um, which is totally inadequate. Um, we don't understand what process they're using to give people tests, if people, like what people need to do to request a test. Um, we, at one point, they released that their testing protocol was that if somebody has symptoms, they will test them for influenza. And if they're positive for influenza, then they, um, they say that that must be what the problem is and they let them out of quarantine, put them back in the general population. COVID-19 and influenza can be co-occurring, so that's one way that it could be spreading. People who have both uh, are not getting tested for COVID-19, and they're going back out with symptoms with active infection into the population. Um, we don't know if that's still their policy, but that was definitely their policy at one point. Um, and we also know that a lot of is times this, people are um, trying to get tests or, or people are afraid to get tests. They're afraid to admit that they have symptoms or to uh, request a test because what the DOC does is if you uh, say that you have symptoms or if you request a test, they put you into quarantine, which is functionally the same as disciplinary segregation. Um, you can lose, you lose access to your property, you lose access to communication. Um, and so people don't want to do that. And so even if people who are afraid, who who think they're sick uh, would rather be able to still talk to their families. Um, and it's just 
totally unconscionable for the DOC to set up that deterrence to prevent people from testing. And I believe that's why, um, even though we know from contacts inside Wuhan and Columbia, that there are a lot of sick people there, um, but they, their testing numbers are very low, probably because people aren't requesting tests because they don't want to be um, put basically in the hole for it. Right. Well, All right. especially because my son has taken off our out of the Institute to Black Rivers uh, place to have his infusions mm -hmm. and they've never once tested him. Huh. So, I mean, he has not shown signs, thank the good Lord, but it's still a concern, you know? Definitely. All right, uh, Tamika, do you have anything else that you would like to add before we go to questions? Uh, yeah, they give you questionnaires now uh, for the infusion information. I, I'm familiar with that process. Um, it's a questionnaire that they will have you fill out. Um, asking you about the symptoms or where you've been, if you've been in contact with anyone that had the COVID-19. Um, but my, my thing is, um, if you're not having symptoms, because we know COVID-19, a lot of people are just tearing it, beating it, and not even know that they had it. Um, how does that, like, stop them from spreading it to the other inmates? You know, if you don't know you have it, you're going to pass it around continuously, you know. Um, it's like a domino effect. Yes, that's something we're hearing from a lot of people as well, that the guards are not practicing social distancing. Many of them are not wearing masks. Many of them are not doing the things that they need to do to protect against exposing people. Um, Peg, is there anything that you'd like to add before we go to questions? Yeah, a, a couple things. Um, I am I'm told that when, when they are put in SEG, this is a common pro uh, problem, uh, they often now are losing all their property. That's one of the reasons um, uh, that, that they don't, um, it's just bad. And the other thing is to help also, this is a body that has no um, power because it doesn't vote and families tend to be um, don't bring up prisons and one thing you can do is contact your legislature get your people to contact the legislators and um, uh, make this a, a power block and the other thing is that not only are the for me uh, the 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 blame is always put on the prisoners that they are they are at fault for spreading the virus when, of course, they can't spread. They they don't aren't out. Um, that they do not get sanitizers themselves. They cannot sanitize once they they get the whatever it is. Um, and and the soap for those that are indigenous indigenous uh, uh, indigent are is very inadequate. Um, that they are not given even if they're in a cell by themselves. The, the the means to protect themselves and that's to me uh inconscionable mm -hmm. okay so we're gonna go to questions uh we have one question from okay okay can can we hear me okay um, so my name is Courtney. My husband is incarcerated. He is currently in Stanley. Um, on March 19th, he was actually on his way to Chippewa Valley for um, his ERP program. That transfer got intercepted because on March 18th, um, Wapan had two uh, positive tests for COVID, one being an inmate, one being a staff member. Turns out the cellmate of the inmate who uh, was positive uh, was on the bus. So everybody, these 42 inmates were exposed on the bus. They all got rerouted to Stanley, which is the Northern Transfer Point, um, held in quarantine. They were not allowed to make phone calls for three days. Nobody, nobody knew what was happening. Um, and so they eventually started letting them make phone calls. First problem there was 
yes, they do go to the hole when they are being quarantined. Not only do they go to the hole, but a lot of times in a lot of facilities, these are in dry cells. That means there are no sinks, are no toilets, they are not washing. First thing everybody tells us about COVID, wash your hands all the time, wash your body all the time, wash your face all the time. Um, and they're not even making it possible. Showers three times a week is certainly not sufficient when uh, the whole pandemic uh, is, is supposedly manageable by washing. Um, so they're not even giving the tools. Um, with uh, speaking of tools, I do know that um, Union Supply Direct, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard this for your loved ones, but they are providing four of the um, disposable face masks to wear in the meantime, while there are um, cloth face masks being sent out as well. Um, and that was something that my husband was really adamant about making sure that everybody understood that is from Union Supply Direct. They are funding it and donating it per their own expense. That is not from DOC. Um, DOC is making the cloth masks as they can. Um, but Union Supply Direct has been absolutely fantastic with uh, their outreach to every, um, every facility that they can help. Um, and then, um, the as far as the guards go um one of the things that we found helps is if there is a pat down the inmate can respectfully and i stress that i cannot stress that enough because obviously everybody's on you know high alert right now that includes the guards they're stressed right now um but they can turn around and say i do not object to a search but i would prefer to be strip searched this means that a guard does not come within however many feet of them, does not come into direct contact with them, um, and because the guards are not wearing face masks, um, it's, it's allowing the distance um, and keeping the inmates at a little bit of a distance. I understand that that's a horrible option because, okay, so now we have to be demeaned in order to keep ourselves safe, but Unfortunately, these guys are used to those searches. They don't find them nearly as offensive as we do. Um, and that is an option that my husband has, has requested. He's told them, I am high risk, he has asthma, he has uh, diabetes, which has been uh, so poorly managed that he now is going into kidney failure, thanks to the DOC. And, um, uh, and also uh, is morbidly obese. So he's got all sorts of different kind of risk factors. Um, and so, you know, when he respectfully asked the sergeant, you know, I, I don't object to a search, but could I do a strip search instead so that we don't have direct contact? I just watched you pat down five other guys with those same gloves and no face mask. The guards that's a really are- That's a good tip. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. I think that's something that, that a lot of people could, inside could do um, to protect themselves. We'll start telling people about that idea. Yeah, um, and like I said, you know, I mean, to us that sounds demeaning, but for them, um, to them, a search is a search at this point. They have been naked in that building so many times, they don't care. They really don't. <laughs> like, if it comes down to pride or safety, they're going to choose safety. So that is something that um, he's, and he's actually helping coach um, some of the younger inmates. He's 39. So he's helping coach some of the younger inmates. Hey, cool down, you know, be respectful and you'll get further. Um, and that really does seem to be helping. Um, and um, the uh, Governor Evers, I don't know who got this. I got it in an email yesterday. Uh, Governor Evers did send out a letter as far as um, what the plan is coming up, as far as why we're still social distancing, why we're not opening on May 1st, like the states around us, as well as the actual Badger Care rollout. Um, which basically outlines the phases. So for anybody that did get that, um, that's something that I actually copied and pasted into my husband's email today, last night. Mm -hmm. um, so that way he can pass that around his unit and they can get firsthand um, knowledge of what the rest of us are seeing. They only get snippets in there when they're watching the news and stuff like that. So I find that keeping him um, educated, sending him the different news stories that I'm finding is really helping keep him calm, uh, really helping him trust that I'm working on it for him, I'm trying to get through. Um, the DOC is not my biggest fan. 
they hear from me a lot. Um, we have had several issues uh, since his incarceration, which is only a 30 month sentence, which now uh, threatens to be a life sentence um, or a death sentence, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so they hear from me a lot. They, uh, they do get back to me after, you know, they find that I'm not going to stop calling. Uh, right. Who I get passed off to? Well, depends on the day. Sometimes I get information. A lot of time it's just the stronghold of we're doing everything we can to take care of the persons in our care. Um, taking no liability, of course, because why would we do that? Right. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and the biggest thing that I've said, I've got a lot of friends that are actually guards for federal prisons. So they are on a very different end of this. Um, and I try to be sympathetic to both sides because obviously, you know what, guards are going through a tough time too. And these people are on the front lines of being blamed for what our legislator legislatures are doing. Mm -hmm. um, so they have it tough too, but you know, um, a lot of them hold the position of, well, they did the crime, they've got to deal with the consequences, that's why they're in there. And, um, you know, just like uh, the, the woman had said prior, that this isn't, I, I believe Miss uh, Mrs. Swan said, you know, this isn't supposed to be a death sentence, there's not a death penalty um, in the state of Wisconsin, and that's what we're subjecting these guys to. They are literally sitting ducks in there. Um, and so that's probably my biggest response is, hey, you know, yeah, these guys deserve to be punished for what they did. That's why they're there. But there are other options of punishment that are not going to require them to die for their crimes. Um, All right, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to a question from uh, Bruce at the Journal Sentinel. Um, so Ty, if you can unmute him, but I'm going to just start by reading the question. Um, did FFUP send a batch of clemency requests prior to today's 31? Um, when and how many and were they all denied? Um, Peg, do you want to field that? Hold on. Well, well, Peg's getting requested. I can, uh, I can just say that we, this is the first batch that we're yeah, sending. We've done the executive, um, the extraordinary release, the executive 31. And that has, just now, it has been put through as an okay option, but we've never done the clemencies. Mm -hmm. There have been um, other, I've, I've heard of people applying for clemencies um, and being denied. Um, there was one woman who is very close with Joyce Elwanger, who's a like noted civil rights uh, person. Um, she was able to get her friend released on uh, uh, like health emergency. That was, that was executive. That was the executive thirty one. Okay. Yeah. Right. And that was the only one. And then they told us that that was it's not in the system. No warden knows about it. Now the wardens at least know about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're starting to see some some movement on uh, that that means of getting people released. But this is the first batch of these clemency re waiver requests that we're that we're putting in. Um, I hope that answers your question, Bruce. Bruce, did you have anything you wanted to add or any other uh, follow-up question? Um, sure, maybe Peg could just explain the difference. Uh, she's referring to Executive 31. Just distinguish that from these clemency batches that uh, are being sent out today. Yeah, there's a... Um there's a um, extra, uh, release for extraordinary uh, circumstances um, for TIS, truth and sentencing people. There's, they get a sentence modification. I just lost my thing. And uh, they, there's a sentence modification they're going through now. Um, but this is, the DLC is only giving it out to people who have, have low, um, no violent crime. The um, then there's executive um, directive 31, which um, gives it's very broad. Uh, um, again, all kinds of ex extraordinary circumstances, and that is for old law prisoners. Okay. Okay. And Got this it. one is this one. What we're doing is trying to make it for everybody, anybody that can make the point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is to, to appeal directly to the governor. The governor has the power to grant clemencies and pardons, um, oh, yeah. however, on, on whatever kind of basis he wants. But the basis that he created were these very restrictive criteria 
that exclude everybody who's currently incarcerated or has um, is is on uh, supervision or has it's taken more than five years um, for that they've been off supervision for more than five years um, is what's required for them to even be considered by the pardon board. So okay. these are waivers that we're sending in asking them to bypass those criteria and right. actually consider people. Okay. Yeah, there's one more thing about it. The, the difference between the executive director, and I lost my screen, is that um, the parole, um, it goes to the warden who is supposed to uh, say whether the guy's eligible for, for parole, and then the, the uh, parole chairman, Tate, decides. With the executive clemency, it's Evers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you get along with your warden, you know, um, executive um, directive is, is good. Uh -huh. But we haven't seen Tate actually grant any of those either. And when I spoke Except with that, him about that was, it, that was the one he did right. for um, the one you were talking about. That was Tate. Oh, okay. That's great. That's good news. It was, however, after an individual appointment by Joyce Elwanger. Ah, uh, okay. She All right. So um, we're going to move on to the next question from Isaiah with the uh, Wisconsin Examiner. Um, Isaiah, are you here? Oh, my bad. Hold on. We're going to get you unmuted real quick. Hello. There you are. Hello, hello everyone. Um, yeah, my question was in the chat, but uh, I can uh, re ask it here in a second. Um, so uh, what do you all um, have to say to people who may not be uh, empathetic to the plight of, uh, incarcerate, of people incarcerated during these times because of the fact that they committed crimes and they are incarcerated? Uh, we posted an article on incarceration today and there are people sharing that sentiment. So what do you have to say to people like that? Uh, can I, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> we can all answer. Big deal is that um, the incarceration is supposed to be the punishment, not torture within within the incarceration. And also, we tend to, as a society, um, have a very a strong lack of compassion that. We are all capable of um, harm, and um, we are all uh, redeemable. We all are able to be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. Jody or Tamika, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, again, Jody and Tamika, you uh, yes, also I do. Go ahead, Tamika. Yes, I would definitely like to add to that uh, because, again, you know what. When people talk about second chances, is it like persistence or getting preferences? You know, anyone can have a second chance and to do better, but especially with the years away that they've had to supposedly be re rehabilitated. We all know the system's supposed to rehabilitate the inmate, but it's not. It's a lot of cruelty, a lot of uh, uncleanliness, uh, the living situations are very poor up in there. Um, so, I mean, it's like, until your family is affected by it, people usually don't care. But when your loved ones are affected by it, then it brings a broader eye on the situation. Uh, everybody deserves a second chance, and everyone could be uh, rehabilitated, in my opinion. Some um, quicker than others, uh, and, so, and the ones that can't, you know, uh, how do you know if they haven't given that chance? You know, when you treat humans like animals, that's what you're going to get animal behavior. Um, I'm just saying, everyone deserves to, if the law is made to uh, protect us or to uh, handle people that break the law, uh, it should be fair across the board. Wisconsin does not have death penalty. So why should they pay with their lives because they're an inmate? That's right. Um, Jody, did you, would you like to add anything? Yes, I'd just like to say, uh, kind of like back up what both ladies have said, um, they are in there, yes, because of a crime they committed, and they are paying for what they've done. They shouldn't have to pay with their lives also, 
like I said, Wisconsin is not a death penalty state, but yet this is a death sentence for many. And my son didn't ask to have the autoimmune disorder, but he got it when he was incarcerated for the lack of the medical attention and was told several times that he was faking it. Um, we just need for people to understand, yes, what they've done to get in there. They understand that. They know what, they're, what they've done wrong. They're trying to rehabilitate themselves, but they're not getting any kind of rehabilitation until four to six months before the release date. And instead of rehabilitating all the while that they're incarcerated, that's just not happening. But like I said again, and the other ladies, they are paying for their crimes. They shouldn't have to pay with their lives. So yeah, I agree with everything that you all have said. I have um, traveled the country doing plays about prison abolition, and I've gone to you know criminology conferences and things like that. So I try to sometimes also use some other sorts of arguments with people who uh, have those detractions. Um, and I've had these conversations many times, and I think a lot of people don't have a very realistic understanding of what prison is and how it works and how it functions in our society. The number of people who are actually, like the number of crimes that get reported, and then uh, of the ones who get reported that you know go all the way through to a sentence, um, and are, are very low. There are many more people committing any of these types of crimes than are in prison for it. So the people in prison, in, in very real terms, are the criminals who were unlucky and got caught, while the other criminals are still out here. Um, and it's also true that the prison system, like the vast majority of people, do not have trials. They were not found guilty by a jury. Um, they are, almost everyone in prison is poor. They are disproportionately um, black, brown, and indigenous. Um, and so there's these, the, the prison system functions as uh, an institution of harm that targets those populations, um, uh, racial, racialized groups and uh, low income communities. That's who the prison system uh, attacks, not criminals. It's not, there's the correlation between race and class is much stronger than the correlation between people who have actually committed any crimes. Um, and I know that's a hard to thing to try to convince somebody who's skeptical of, but that's what the facts are. And um, so I try to enlighten people to the reality of how the system works and what, um, what that means and what that comes with. And sometimes those arguments, um, in addition to the more like emotion based and, and like, you know, appeals to justice that um, the other women who spoke before me all, all spoke to, um, sometimes those can be effective. Can I say uh, something? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, what I was trying to figure out how to say what you just said so eloquently, uh, it is the poor and the, I think the prison you is, is used as a way to funnel um, the, um, uh, what you call it, those that are not, are not productive enough that there's so much money in, in the prison that it is the, the desperate and the poor that get funneled into it. If we look at what we don't do when, uh, you know, $5 billion is, is stolen from us in, in the last uh, 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 crash, uh, those aren't crimes. You know, the, but the right. crimes are poor and desperate. <laughs> we have one more question from Isaiah. Uh, we have one more question from Isaiah. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is just, uh, uh, were there any updates on the Wisconsin Resource Center issue? And uh, since then, since uh, you haven't got any response to your letter, do you have anything you want to say to the DOC and other officials in light of the yeah. response to your letter? That's it. So the Wisconsin Resource Center issue, that was um, we, one of our contacts in Oshkosh Correctional works in the laundry and they get laundry, dirty laundry from all across the system, um, including the Wisconsin Resource Center, which is not a DOC facility. It is, um, you know, people who've been convicted are held there. Um, and there are DOC staff as the guards, but it's run by the D 
Department of Health Services. Um, and so they're not included on the list of who's getting tested or uh, where there have been exposures on the DOC's website. But this laundry worker got a bag back that had COVID-19 written on it. Um, and they had to handle that bag of laundry. Um, they, they were allowed to wear masks when they were on the job. Um, they've been making masks, and so, but they weren't allowed to wear them outside of the place where they were actually working. They were often not uh, allowed to change their clothes. So they would work with dirty laundry from across the, the system and then go and have to eat without changing their clothes, being able to take a shower in the, in the interim. So when we heard about this bag that had COVID-19 written on it, I tried calling the DHS, I tried calling Wisconsin Resource Center, I didn't get through, I didn't get any answers to any of that. We alerted um, media people to it and it sounds like none of them got answers either. Um, and yeah, so I also sent out a, a long letter to Makafesahaya and CC'd other um, uh, state officials on it and also like forwarded to the media. Um, addressing all of these concerns and haven't heard from, from them either. We're very uh, frustrated and disappointed with the lack of response and the lack of transparency from the DOC. Um, we, when this first started happening, uh, we did an occupation outside of Secretary Carr's house. We were across the street from his house all day long for two days from dawn till dusk. Um, and then we, we've gone back a few times to try to ask him questions and to try to get any um, anything anything from him, get him to, to make a public statements about the, 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 the danger that the incarcerated people are in. And we're, we're not getting honesty and transparency from the DOC. Uh, and we're really disappointed. We were hoping that uh, with the new administration and with all these people who come in, they came in, you know, shouting about how they were gonna reform things. They told us they were working on all these things, um, but we're, we're not seeing results. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. So I think um, Emily Hamer has a question. Oh, right Emily now. has oh, a question. I'm just messaging her back. Y'all might want to mute me again too. Yeah, I'll get you muted. Thanks, Isaiah. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, I don't think that Emily can um, hear you guys because she's uh, muted on our system. But she was asking what the total number of clemency requests are. So yeah, we. Um, Peg is going to be filing, I believe, 31 clemency requests uh, tomorrow. She's going to put them in the mail, um, but we've received more since then. Peg, do you have uh, numbers? Peg, did we lose you? Oh, sorry, my fault. One second, we're going to get you unmuted. Um, there's just a lot. I have. I I know I have 30 sitting here that I haven't even opened. Mm. And and what we need to get through it first of all process so it's done more efficiently than i i do and also through that that as soon as we um you know that we can't we're not gonna we're not gonna go through here with with thousands of them we have to open up we have to open up the pathway you know mm -hmm. yeah there's by next week there'll be at least 30 35 and then emily's um subsequent question is if we're wondering she's wondering if the goal is to have these requests uh, go through the part of the advisory board. The the goal is for the governor to release people, um, but we expect that he'll probably take these requests and send them to the pardon advisory board. We're sending them directly to the governor. Um, we're not sending them to the pardon advisory board. Uh, the pardon advisory board has has issued very very few pardons, even within the very limited criteria that the governor set they're refusing people um, pardon. So people who've been off paper for five years who had nonviolent offenses um, are still not getting releases uh, or not getting pardons and they're not getting their full rights restored. Um, and that's absurd. And so, yeah, we're, we don't trust the Pardon Advisory Board to do much of anything on this either. Um, so we're, we really recognize that for anything that we're doing to be effective, we need to be continually exerting pressure on uh, the governor. All right, I think uh, just to make sure that there's room for anybody else who has questions, we're gonna kind of go through and start unmuting people. So uh, if you could 
mute yourself uh, if you don't have a question or anything to say so that there's not so much feedback and noise on the system. We'd appreciate that. Uh, but you'll be able you'll you'll be able to ask questions now if you have any to, to ask or add. Hello. I have to be uh, sounds like Tamika, you have oh. a question? Yeah, hello? Hi. Hello? Okay. We can hear you. So, okay, my thing is, okay, but my brother, his situation, he's been gone almost 16 years. Okay, he was the victim of malicious prosecution by the Milwaukee County District Attorney. Um, and his two co defendants is at least uh, with his crime. He wasn't even the main person but he was just dealt with all of this time so he has he, he, he has a vital crime so my thing is will this make a difference in his case or is this just for people that just or inmates that just have non-violent crime or that's on their way out the very door that have served all of their time yeah so this is we are requesting a waiver of the criteria that says that only nonviolent crimes and only people who've already done their time can get pardons. Um, so this is, we're asking for an exception to what the governor set as his rules um, that would include people like okay. DeWitt and anybody else, regardless of what they're in there for. But okay. we don't know whether or not the governor is gonna honor that at all. We don't have the power to make him do that. Yeah, of course. Um, but we're okay. we're trying to have everybody everybody who wants to uh, make this appeal. So does that include the people that are looking at like my son? His ERP date is March of two thousand twenty one, which is just under a year away. So that would include him too, because he's in for a violent crime. It, it, I mean, we we support anybody who uh, who wants to, who believes they have a strong case for why they should be released in the time of emergency because of COVID-19 to file one of these uh, waiver requests. Um, we don't know if the governor is going to release anybody on them. It's kind of, it's a long shot, but we're encouraging people um, to take action, to do what they can to protect themselves and to try to get out. And we don't discriminate against people based on their original conviction. We, we don't believe in reducing people to the worst mistake that they made. Um, we believe that people can change and that um, you, you, deserve, uh, you deserve to be supported in society instead of uh, held in a cage uh, and possibly killed there. We have a response from Courtney who said that her husband also tried going for sentence modification directly to the judge um, that tried his case and was immediately denied claiming that the virus coronavirus is not reason enough to modify a sentence so courtney is asking if it may be effective to lobby judges as well since they may be more accessible so does anybody have any thoughts on that i imagine that depends judge by judge there are some judges who are up for election who might be up for election in um, districts or areas that are sympathetic to uh, releasing people um, there might be some judges who are up for election and have built their careers and their identity on being tough on crime, um, and they're they're unlikely to be sympathetic. Um, we're hoping to that the work that we're doing, the advocacy that we're doing, the noise and the alarm that we're trying to sound across the state is going to improve the chances for everybody to take whatever um, avenue they want to try to pursue. And then I heard him had a follow-up question asking, um, he said that, looks like he heard that we, we said that Evers did grant one direct clemency um, with the connection with the Elwingers. That was months was that ago. True? Okay. Yeah. That was, that was Tate also. It was, right. Okay, so he's specifically asking who was it and then when was it granted? It was, um, she's an elderly lady. Um, um, Rose Daniels was his, her name. I think that was her first name. And uh, we have been, she was one of about five people that for, uh, we just battered with this executive uh, clemency, uh, executive directive 31. And um, 
finally, um, uh, Elwinger went and had an appointment with Tate, and, and, which at least opens it up. Before that, they were saying it doesn't exist. Um, the, the other thing is that I don't think this will work unless we put pressure and embarrass people. We must have media. I mean, I, when I say go to your legislature, whatever, we have to raise, raise it. Uh, it is just too easy. We have to, you know, we are all one. We are all brothers and sisters. Raise these people up above the level of, they're not even beasts. They're just nothing. And, and um, they know it. And the prisoners know it. And, and we, this is what we're fighting. And it's, it's, uh, it's a big, big ba battle. It, they let prisoners drown in, 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 uh, in Louisiana, you know. Yeah. Um, we have some other people that are still unmuted. I have a 920 number. It looks like you might have a question. Feel free to speak up if you would like. Is Gerard still? Hello? I have, oh, go ahead. Hi, this is Beatrice. Hi, Beatrice. Hi, I'm new to this. Um, but I am so happy to be able to connect with all of you. Finally, I've been working on this over the years uh, with my son in and out of prison. Um, hopefully this is the last time. He is currently at Columbia Correctional Institute, institution. Um, my concern is, yeah, the health, the staffing. Um, I know he's emailed me. He's had swollen feet for three weeks and finally, well, he actually, the other day, signed a release for me to contact the nurse, and I was able to communicate with her, finally. It took how many times? But, and he's only 35, and they said, yeah, that's unusual for his feet to be that way. Possibly a side effect of one of his medication, even though it's a medication that helps that. So they're actually investigating that now. Thank the Lord for that. Um, but yeah, my concern is the staffing. Um, the fact that, yes, this um, lockdown over there severely right now, especially with the escapees this last week or so, um, and just no family contact. I mean, what it's doing to them mentally also and to provide them with some kind of program or something to able for them to communicate. I know some prison systems actually have um, where they have like FaceTime, you can actually set up. It may not be through this core links. You know, I don't know how it would take to do that. Also, you know, just to even see them through a window or a glass, just to, you know, do a temp check on us, just like they should be doing for the guards walk. I hope they're taking temp checks for the guards. And I did hear, listening to this conversation today, that one of the nurses had to wear a mask because she was positive but had no symptoms and they still made her come to work and that was that believe at that facility also right yeah <laughs> um and then i was wondering about also what can i mean every i believe every prison in the state has a courtyard is that true or not in the state of wisconsin it's not true. There are some, like MSDF has no outdoor rec, but uh, most places have, have some kind of outdoor um, space. Okay. I mean, this is the state of Wisconsin. I feel, you know, the state should provide adequate people to come in and help with a situation like this for the COVID-19, whether it's the National Guard, the Army, whoever need be to set up a tent even within the facility, whatever. I mean, if the state, do you know what I'm saying? They provide a, state prisons for people that do, you know, need to do time for their um, crime and stuff. So why can't the state provide adequate for them? Right. Make sense? <laughs> yeah. So... Is um, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Um, no, I, 
I agree that there that there needs to be uh, a better response. They need to find ways to be creative and um, get people released. And the the loss of visitation and the loss of contact with family is devastating at this time. It's people are uh, under a lot of stress, and when they put facilities on lockdown or modified movement, that increases tension within the facilities and. Um, taking away visits, uh, well, it makes sense, is, is also just very uh, hard and, and makes it harder for people to deal with that, those, those stresses. Um, two things Correct. from people on the chat. Okay. Um, so Kay says that the 1994 crime bill talks of private prisons expanding at an alarming rate. Um, and that talk, uh, it also talks of a number of agreements that states pay a fee if the prison population dips below that quota of usually 95% or 90% capacity. Um, so does this, that 94 crime bill apply to state prisons and is that why Evers won't reduce the prison population? So my understanding of uh, the private prison quota situation doesn't apply to Wisconsin uh, because Wisconsin oh, is okay. a state run prisons. Um, the, the 94 crime bill was vast and in, involved many different things um, that definitely caused a lot of the problems in Wisconsin prisons. There's a lot of funding for truth and sentencing, which is, uh, which is uh, okay. truth and sentencing is what caused the expansion of the population in Wisconsin prisons. I should, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I should, uh, one thing, um, a couple of speakers before, thing, talking about that nurse I talked about. That hey, Sean, this is my answer. Yeah. I'm just going to send you an email um, with a quick question, but you can also reach me at 414-704-0177. Thanks so much. Bye. I don't know who that is. Okay. Sorry. We're, we're experimenting with opening up and, and trying to let everybody talk, but we can't have too many people talking at once. Go it's ahead, just, Peg. It's just a correction because we might have media here. The nurse that was that was that that had the mask on that was changing the guy's bandage. She was exposed. She wasn't positive. She was exposed to the media. And mm. the other the other thing that I think in future, uh, the other thing is that we have a very poor um, as far as uh, if you're poor, you don't get justice in this. There are a tremendous amount of people in our prisons that are innocent. We had to, up until a few months ago, we had the lowest paid public, public defenders in the nation. It is an assembly line. If you've ever been into any of those supposed courts, um, they're, 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 they're left. They're right. Hopeless. And uh, I also recently learned that Wisconsin has the lowest payout if you are uh, found innocent. Yeah. So if you're proven innocent, you in other places you get you know ten thousand dollars a year and you you get something to pay you back um, for what happened. But in Wisconsin, it's like a limit of five thousand dollars a year and for only five years. So only the first five years that you were unjustly imprisoned do you get paid for in Wisconsin, and that's all you get to try to get yourself back on your feet after being robbed of your freedom uh, through you know a uh, false. Um, I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. So you're saying you only can get that amount if you're uh, in the that's only for five years. So after that, they just don't have any. any yes, the pay the payout to people who are proven innocent is very very low in Wisconsin. Um, it looks like wow. Gerard. Can I just um, to hear you? Sorry, Tamika, did you have anything else to add? Um, I, I just was uh, questioning about the indigent uh, part of uh, your answer. Yeah. Okay. About how much the guy gets out, you know, in Wisconsin, and how much money he's going to get to put himself back on his feet. And she's probably thinking, oh, God, you know, if he does get out, what is he going to do? Five right. a year? Shit. 
Um, can I ask a question about uh, how these exec? Thank you, first of all, for organizing this press conference. This is Patrick Harrington. Hey, Patrick. Thanks um, for joining us. Hey, Ben. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. I'm calling um, kind of a specific question because uh, my friend Derwin's at WSPF, and he is past his mandatory release date. And I'm just wondering if there's any, I was kind of trying to piece together for things that would affect, I know, like, are, is there anything that deals with that issue as far as people who are still in prison past the mandatory release date who are now, of course, being at greater risk because of this COVID-19? That's what, why they're there. That's what they're talking about. I can't answer. No, I, I, I'm just, I, I, my question is just that if, is the exceptions that you're that you're submitting these clemency applications would the people who would are you asking for exceptions for people who would be eligible for release say like they are past a mandatory release date but they haven't been released yet is there any is there any reason that they could or couldn't take advantage of these kinds of clemency applications I would I would assume that there would not be any consequence to filing the clemency request waiver, um, and the fact that they're past their mandatory release would be one of the arguments that they'd want to make in the waiver um, that would in, improve their chances of uh, getting granted a release. Okay, I just I, I just know that there's some legal issues there, so that's, that's why I'm asking if there's any been any discussion of that, or because I know mm -hmm. there are quite a few people who fit in that category. Yeah, I am not a, a legal expert at all, and I don't. I mean, personally, don't understand how mandatory release doesn't mean release and they're out. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah that's definitely that something either. that that boggles my mind. But the DOC is uh, real good at that. I can answer some of that, if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, thank you. Uh, there is, um, I've been wondering, because mandatory release, uh, PMR was always only for those that uh, uh, really proved themselves not eligible. Lately, they have made it, um, tremendous amount of people are, they're just trying to keep you in, in prison. And I asked a litigator and he said there was a Supreme Court they went up to the Supreme Court and all they have to say for to get uh, PMR is the same for parole. So there's no, it's totally arbitrary. In other mm. words, I am putting through that argument for a few people, adding it to their, to their waivers because um, yeah, it's arbitrary. Um, uh, and I think it's a very good argument to say, this guy should have been out, boom. Uh, well, and in his case, in his case, too, I think there he also is he could have previously only been released when he completes a program, but now he's transferred somewhere where he can't do the program, and now he can't be he's, they're not doing I emailed well. seeing if he could get transferred, and he's not being he can't be transferred now either, so it's kind of a catch twenty two thing yeah. where they say, okay, you're going to get you closer, but we're not you're not allowed to do the thing that would <laughs> potentially get you closer to release so. this is how they've kept kept old law prisoners in. Uh, decades and decades after they're uh, they're parole eligible, and it absolutely make make the argument. Yeah. So Gerard and Linda, do you? It sounds like uh, you all have something to say. <laughs> I think you can probably hear Linda in the background. <laughs> I, said, uh, I basically said oh, that. Uh, I basically said that they're more organized um, on that end of transferring people to keep them from um, getting out of prison than they are for doing anything else for an inmate. They can stop a, 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 a transfer in the middle of a street and, 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 and reroute that person to some other prison to make sure they, can get it. they can't get out more than they even look at the paperwork to get someone out. And I, you know, I almost think that that system is just set up to, you know, it's set up to keep people in rural areas that have no money to get them their money. You know, do you know what I mean when you mm -hmm. look at mm -hmm. smaller places, the smaller rural areas with the aldermen sitting in that area who helps to protect their communities because their communities are so small they can't really take care of themselves. So they use the prisoners 
um, to take care of them, taxes, everything like that. And they have a system that's already set up to, to stop the, the, the prison reform. Because if you take prisoners out, there is going to be a prison reform, whether you want it or not. And they don't want it, and it's not gonna it's not gonna be allowed because the system is and, and the system is set up well to stop us from getting prisoners out. Right. There's a, an internal culture in the DOC um, that we can like was most explicitly stated in 1994. This memo that the the secretary sent out, and FFUP talks about this all the time where they were, you know, there was a law change that was gonna reduce sentences or get people on parole um, out more easily at that time. And the response from the governor, from Governor Tommy Thompson and um, the head of the prisons at that time was they were going to do everything they could within the, the legal bounds to prevent anybody from being released. And so they found all of these different bureaucratic methods they could do of bouncing people around to prevent transfers um, or, or transferring people to prevent them from getting programming, uh, finding different pretexts that they could use to withhold somebody and prevent them from getting in. And that became, for you know, a decade and a half, uh, the culture of the DOC is based on holding people. Um, and like, like you were saying, Linda, the... Uh, that ties in with the economy of these small towns that, um, you know, re rely on prisons for jobs. Um, but it has also gotten out of hand. It's gone beyond that to the point where uh, people don't want to be working these jobs and they're doing mandatory overtime as prison guards and they hate it and they would rather be doing something else with their lives. Um, and the DOC can't hire enough people to keep holding the people that they're circulating through these different means of keeping people trapped. It's a, it's a really absurd monster that is, has gone beyond, um, it, it's like, you know, it, it bit off more than they can chew. So um, I got a comment. Um, just to give you a little background, um, for those of us, for those of you who don't know us, uh, me and Linda, uh, we host a radio show on WORT 89.9 FM, and that that uh, it's called Soul Sessions, and it goes out to a lot of the prisons in the surrounding Madison area. So we get a lot of uh, emails and uh, uh, letters from prisoners, and uh, they've been keeping us up to date on what's been going on in the prisons in terms of the response to the COVID-19 and uh, asking that, uh, you know, we share the information. And uh, so is there anything else that you can think of that we who have uh, our conduit to these prisoners and these uh, various institutions can do besides, you know, we share a lot of articles. We have about 350 people on our core links list. So we send out any new information that we can you know, come across on the various other sites, uh, you know, Wisdom and Expo. And so we try to make sure they get a lot of that information. And that is indeed comforting to them. And um, all the emails that we get, we try our best to respond. So everybody gets a response. But, um, and we also pass this information on to, of course, uh, you, Peg Swan and Ben Turk, um, so that you're aware. But I know you're, you know, you don't have a lot of resources. You don't have a lot of people. Um, is there anything that you guys need uh, as far as resources and people or help to, you know, help get these reports out and things like that? Yeah, so I, I want to uphold and, and like recognize and congratulate you for the work that you all do, um, both through the radio show and all of that um, correspondence through CoreLinks. We really appreciate um, the stuff that you're able to get. Um, and, and share with us. Uh, it's really powerful and, and helpful. Um, it's a big education for us as well. I mean, listening to everything you guys are talking about and uh, the prisoners educate us as well. Because some of the stuff we knew, but we didn't know it to these extremes that mm -hmm. we've been hearing it. Hey, I, yeah. I, I oh, go ahead, Peg. I want you to do. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is if I do, I need to do another shout out that I have about 200. And I don't get to answer. I keep telling them I, I can't answer each e email. But if I could, you would also, maybe we can coordinate on uh, getting the uh, information 
right now the the, the uh, newsletter is kind of blocked that i could yeah we've yeah. experienced we're, that too. we're getting blocked more than now that we started sending stuff out from F fup <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more too so i have a question for peggy okay hey what is the address for to mail that waiver back to you it's my address it, i think it's um do you just oh, okay. I'll send it to your email. Okay, I got it. And then I have a one more last. I have one more last question. If an inmate was sentenced to go through a program, but then because uh, the state failed him, why is that held against the inmate? Can I do okay? I, I can answer this. Um, there is a waiver. They just waive it for truth and sentencing. The truth and sentencing guys go, go out, they're released on their date, ready or not, straight from SAG, no treatment. They just waive the programs. They have, so they will waive a program, can be for anybody, but they will not do it for truth and sentencing. I think- For, their, for old law. law. For old law, I mean, for old law. I think it's a, and we have written, we've everything, and it's another one of those, just, um, there's a lot of that, um, that uh, there is- Another catch. There is a waiver, and you know what we need is is um, you know I'm, I'm hoping that we can hold these regularly because we need to be able to show show the waivers here. This guy, truth and sentencing, got it. Why didn't he? That it, we need more people um, saying the same thing. It's always Ben and I, and and a few others, <laughs> and they're sick of us. Mm. They can just um, they, boom. Ger Gerard, so we'll be and then though, we're, some people are wondering if you could share your email address um, so that people can get their loved ones connected with you on four links. Um, yeah, uh, just it's pgswan3 at aol.com. Okay. And Gerard and Linda, would you like to share yours as well? Oh, uh, our email address? If, if you'd like to have more people sending you messages through core links. Yeah, that's, uh, you use your email actually. Yeah. LD, LD Mathis 5. LD Mathis 5. At yep. Gmail. At gmail.com. Mathis is, is M-A-T-H-I-S 5. Okay. And then mine is insurgent.ben at gmail.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-G-E-N-T dot B-E-N at gmail.com. Um, I'm, I try to keep up with the emails, but it's very difficult to do that and to organize events and things like that at the same time. Um, but I, I, so I'm probably slower on uh, responding and getting through them. Um, but I do my best. Okay, two more questions quick before we go. Um, I have Isaiah was asking what, um, uh, just asking what the what people's views are on the use of national guards in prisons in any capacity. Um, it's, right now, it's being used as medical support. It's medical support. Medical support. But the Evers administration is prepared to use that to supplement the correctional staff. The correctional staff. Uh, I, I mean, when I hear about National Guards in prison, my mind goes to Attica and alarm bells go off. Um, but I assume and hope that if they were brought in in this context, in this situation, it would be um, uh, not that same situation and we would have uh, a better outcome. Um, I think... The, the real problem and the, the solution that we need Governor Evers to take is to release people and to reduce the overcrowding. Um, that's the solution he needed to take a year ago uh, before any of this happened, and it's a solution we really need to see him moving on now. Um, I know earlier on the chat, Courtney asked about, uh, you know, if Governor Evers promised to reduce the prison population by 50%, um, and why is he not taking this opportunity to do that? I, I think the answer to that is political. Um, he knows that prisoner advocates are, are going to vote for him and his party um, because our other choice is somebody who's going to be even worse than him on this. 
And so his only, um, his political future, he thinks he's better off uh, pandering and saying things to us, but not actually doing anything. Um, then, and that way he can keep those uh, blocks of voters that Linda was talking about up north. Um, he can win some of those people over. I think that's what his political priorities are on. And so we need to be challenging that. We need to actually hold his feet to the fire and, and demand that he make moves. Um, we have Jody who has a question, so I'm going to unmute you, Jody. Yes, hi. Um, I'm I just have a question if anybody knows, um, like my son had filed with the PRC a request to try to get the early ERP uh, pushed up from March of next year, but they told him that he needs to file with the EHC. And my question is, since he was incarcerated and denied the medical help to stop this um, the alternative colitis that he ended up with that almost killed him to begin with and was so septic that he was almost in septic shock if there possibly may be another place he could write to or um, another direction he could go or should he just stick with the EHC? Yeah, I have... I have. Peg, do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? You, you know, there is no, there are no pathways here. We're trying to create one. You you need a power block. You need people writing and screaming. Uh, they don't like being embarrassed. They don't like media. That's all we know. You get enough media, you know. Uh, um, there was a, there was a hunger strike and a media for what? He's in he's in Colorado in general after 27 years in solitary. That's the media. You know, uh, there's no, I have no, nothing other than that. Uh, you, uh, a lot of letters. Okay, thank you. Courtney just had one thing to uh, add to the National Guard discussion. National Guard discussion is that her, um, they, they were not wearing personal protective equipment when they went through Stanley. Um, and the last time they, when they were there. Um, and that they claimed they were the same thing that they were the fair to substitute for guard to specifically for guard. Do we? All right, so we are at 2.30. Do we want to pause and turn off the recording of the video and kind of go off the record and, and open the conversation up? And then we'll post the video.